Welcome to Leewood Press. So glad you're here. My name is Ryan Kappel, the pastor here. If you are new, welcome. I know you could be anywhere right now, but you are here. We hope you experience the joy of Jesus. Today is the summer kickoff for middle school. And right here, where are my new sixth graders? Right here? They got kidnapped this morning. You're like, oh, we shouldn't go to this church. Let's visit another one. They got kidnapped. But they got brought in, welcomed by our summer staff interns to say this is going to be the best summer ever. And we're excited. They are talking about at youth group just what we're talking about today, which is this fancy word sanctification, which really means we're called to be set free and not stuck under the oppression of legalism. We've been saved by grace and then called to live in freedom, to love God and love others as ourself. With that, will you stand as we worship God through music? Let's lift it up together. What a healer you are, Jesus. Oh, what a healer you are. Binds up the broken hearted. Breathe into us new life.
thank you so much. Let's continue to just sing together and lift up the name of Jesus in worship. Declare his victory today. Declare his goodness in this place, in this community and family. Let's sing out together. up the, this song together today. Jesus, thank you for your presence. And Lord, we just know that many of us um, may be going through some tough times. We maybe know someone who, who are going through things um, that are um, challenging, that are hard to, hard to see our way through a little bit. And Lord, we just declare today your goodness, your strength, Lord. We declare that you are our cornerstone uh, for those of us who, uh, who call on the name of the Lord. Jesus, you are our cornerstone. And today, Lord, I just pray that this would be 
um, a moment of encouragement, of breakthrough, and of healing this time together in this family. Lord, I pray that each person in this room, including uh, those of us on stage, uh, in kids, running in everything today, Lord, I just pray each person would just be encouraged and blessed and strengthened, Lord, in places of weakness, Jesus. Um, Thank you, Lord, for just personal breakthrough. Um, I know I can reflect that in my own life and relationships, even this week, even yesterday. So I declare that as, as your goodness and your breakthrough and, and pray that and believe for that with uh, all of us in this room, all of us watching online. Lord, I know you want nothing but just, um, but just uh, total healing in relationships, Lord, total healing in our physical bodies, Jesus, total healing in our places of vulnerability and weakness, Lord. And so this song is Cornerstone, and we love to lift your great name high today, Jesus, and sing it out. It is so beautiful and powerful to be together today and sing.
Trust in his righteousness alone Father, stand before the throne Let's just sing together, Christ alone, cornerstone Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for the beauty of these words just being lifted up together. Lord, it just the, the word today is just sweetness. There is a sweetness uh, in your presence, Lord. There's a sweetness uh, in community infused with and surrounded by and filled with the Holy Spirit on this day of Pentecost. There is a sweetness in your arms around us and around our families and our workplaces. Uh, Lord, we're just not whitewashing over things that are challenging, but there is a sweetness today. So I just declare that and, uh, and lean into that on behalf of, um, of me and my family and us and our family in this place, all of us together today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your sweetness and for moments uh, that are just filled with, filled with your love and your power. Thank you, Jesus. In your great name we sing and pray. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Nick. You may be seated. I had the privilege of doing a wedding of a young couple who've been a part of our church for just over a year, Casey Parks uh, and Natalie Clark. Now they're Casey and Natalie Parks. And uh, at the wedding, I met one of Casey's buddies that he grew up with. So Casey Parks went to Chaminade, and if you're a baller, you know what Chaminade means. I mean, some of the, who's, who's watching the playoffs? Anybody care about the championship? Celtics stole one from the world. Does anybody, are we in the wrong church? Maybe you're in the wrong church if you don't know what I'm talking about. No. So I was born in Boston. I have the seal of the Commonwealth on my birth certificate. Jason Tatum went to Chaminade. And this kid, Casey Parks, did too. They're, they're, they're friends. But his real tight buddy is Bradley Beal. You know Bradley Beal? And so I got to meet him. I'm trying not to fanboy. Do you, have you ever been in that situation where you're with someone that you, I mean, I think he's one of the smoothest ballers around. And there's something about, like, I got the witness greatness in my, and, like, I'm also a little taller than you. I'm, I mean, I'm just saying, I, but there's a difference. I don't get, I've got credit card hops, and he could just flush it on anybody at any time. I'm just saying. These are things. But I say this to be witness. That I use this word witness because on this Pentecost Sunday, which means 50 days from the resurrection, this is about the Holy Spirit. Remember, God the Father sent his son Jesus to live, die, and rise from the dead. And then, the Holy, then Jesus went up to heaven and said, don't worry, I'm going to send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. And Acts 1.8 says this, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit and be my witness, is all of you. Because we have witnessed the resurrected Jesus. And we don't just sit in that fanboy moment of Jesus. We go out, we are sent out as the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That was the local place of their everyday lives. For us, it's Johnson County, it's, it's where you live, it's where you go to school, it's where you go to work. Jerusalem, Judea, another layer out. Some of us don't get out of our bubble. We need to. That's why we have ministry partners like Mission Southside, the Urban Classic Center, Freedom Fire Ministries. These are all on our websites, and they're not random ministries. These are relationships that span decades. And we get to walk alongside them in the Judeas of the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Those are our mission trips that we do, and COVID has shut that down, but we're preparing for next year. Most likely Trinidad again. That's been a providential relationship where lives have changed from our community and in Trinidad. We've had them come and lead us in worship. We go and lead alongside. It's not like we're here to save the day. We mutually love and respect and care for each other. And the ends of the earth, which my joke is, is Olathe. But the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth, that's... Go until the world knows 
every nook and cranny, we the church are called to share and show the love of Jesus. That's what this red is all about. Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. When you surrender your life to Christ, simultaneously the Holy Spirit enters into your life and gives you power to live the life God has called us to live in the likeness of Christ. With that, we're going to pray, and then I'll dismiss kids to your environments of spiritual growth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us even while we are sinners. And we have nowhere to go but to take it to the cross, take our sin to you. So thank you, God, for removing our sin as far as the east is from the west. And help us to live freely, not bound up in legalism and oppression, but freely loving you and loving others as ourselves. And this is a, a soul care practice, not just on Sundays, but every moment of every day when we sin, and we're all sinners and we all sin often, we confess that sin to you, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us. And then we're set free to do great things in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help this church to be a movement, not just a place where we sit, listen, and leave, but that we leave transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ, showing people the love of Jesus, proclaiming and performing the gospel, the good news, that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. And he not only wants to save us, but transform us. God, we lift up our prayer family of the week, Tina McGuire, Tina and her kids, Breck and Lauren. Fill them with love and grace as they are a blessing to this community and beyond. Help us to remember that the gospel story is not just an American story, but a world story. And may the gospel root take root in places like Trinidad, where it's roughly 15% Christian. We want to see people see you, God through our prayers and our intentional effort to partner with them in ministry. So bless Pastor Ashik Bechu, who's faithfully been serving you for 60 plus years. Bless their family. Heal them. Bring them hope, joy, and peace in the midst of challenges that they've experienced over the year, most recent years. And God, when we don't know how to pray, we find comfort in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Kids, you're invited to your environments to grow. If you're a new middle schooler, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade is going downstairs with our new middle school director, Presley Stuber. So if you're new, it's a great time to be here. You might think it's the craziest time to be here, but it's the best time to be here if you're new. Later today, after, after worship today, all middle school families are invited to grill out with us. We're serving food on the back patio of the red door. You get to meet other parents if you haven't met other middle school parents. And then after that, the Clockies are hosting a pool party for the middle schoolers, and we're praying for no rain, right? Well, let me just get right into it and allow me to read the word of the Lord from Romans, starting in chapter 5, verse 20 into chapter 6. Hear the word of the Lord. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, Grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? We're in Romans 6. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, 
we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. So that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Thanks be to God. Paul is saying something very interesting, and that is that our sin has been crucified with Christ. We are dead to sin. funny i don't feel dead to sin anybody else sin lately and a lot i kind of like to sin i might have that as a spiritual gift to sin does anybody else feel that at times and yet we're dead to sin i feel it every day we are called to live life free from sin And that's what the church word today is, sanctification. We talked about justification, if you remember. We have been justified by grace. Grace. Nothing we do but what Christ has done. And then we're called to live this life to become more like Christ. At LPC we say, no, grow, show, go. Because I only remember rhyming words. But we want to know God and be fully known. Love, that's love. And then, in that being known and loved fully, saved, justified, we're called to grow in the likeness of Christ. That's sanctification. And then to show God's glory. What is the chief end of mankind? That we glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So show the world that joy of Jesus in your heart. And then we go make disciples. That's what we're called to do. Help people find and follow Jesus. Because Jesus changes everything for everyone. There's no greater mission than being a part of the church. It's the comprehensive nature of salvation. Have you ever read scripture like, well, it says that we were saved, and then we're being saved, and then we will be saved. Have you ever thought, well, those don't seem to, I'm not good at grammar, but that's the comprehensive nature of salvation that we have been saved from the penalty of sin, justification. We are being saved from the presence of sin, because guess what? We live in the world that has sin still in it. And we will be saved. I'm sorry, right now we are, the power of sin exists, but we're being saved from that power. And in heaven we will be saved from the, there will be no presence and no power, and of course no penalty. That's the comprehensive nature of salvation. So these theological terms that we're talking about, because again, we're in this belief series about the basic beliefs of what it means to follow Christ. And the world has some wacky views on what it means to follow Christ. 
these words that we maybe throw around, maybe you've never heard them before, are never meant to be interchangeable. They're different. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. And some of us feel like we're still stuck, like it's, that we're just not good enough or clean enough. It reminds me of the old story of a young man who decided to visit one of his elderly neighbors who had a dog, but they had never spent time together. So he thought, well, let's hang out together. So he goes over, and the guy was fixing breakfast. The old man was fixing breakfast, so the young man joined in, and he looked at the plates, and they were a little kind of grimy and greasy still. I'm like, well, I don't want to say it's my first. And they hung out and ate, and then, you know, are you sure the dishes were clean? And the old man said, you know, it's as clean as cold water gets it. Like, I understand. All right. So they hung out, and all of a sudden they were talking and telling stories, and it's lunchtime. And they got the plates out, and now they're even greasier and grimer, grimy, and like crusts of food on it still. And it's like, are you sure these are clean? And the old man said, it's as, it's as clean as cold water gets it. And then in the afternoon, when the young man finally needed to leave, and his dog, the old man's dog, was sitting in front of the door, he started growling at him. He's like, oh, my gosh. And the old man said, cold water, sit down. Come on, nobody likes that. No. Nah. But the illustration clearly is about we still feel dirty. We still feel, when we, especially when we try to clean ourselves. Because there's only one who can cleanse us of our sin, and it's Jesus. It's not ourselves. When we try to clean ourselves, we still remain dirty and grimy. So these three words, justification, just as if it never happened is one way to think of justification. Sanctification, process by which we become like Jesus. And glorification, perfected in heaven. Don't look to one to do for you what only the other can do. Does that make sense? Don't look to your sanctification process as a means to get into heaven. Boy, I hope I'm good enough. How many people say that? Like, you know, there, there were these questions growing up as a kid called the Kennedy questions. D. James Kennedy was a pastor in Florida. And they're called the Kennedy questions. And the, the people would, Christians would ask people who weren't Christian or just anybody and say, how sure are you that if you were to die tonight that you would go to heaven? And they'd say, well, most people would say, well, I'm pretty good. And, and I, I sure hope I would get into heaven. Well, on one level, I don't know that I like the total binary approach of that question on some level. But the point is this. It's not about us doing anything good or we hope we're good. It's about the work of Jesus that has saved us. So don't confuse sanctification with justification. And glorification means we're given a glorified body in heaven where there is no more pain, sorrow, suffering, and it's nothing but joy, hope, love, peace, everything we are meant to have in our bodies, in our glorified bodies. So as we look at sanctification, the mark of a Christ follower is not perfection, but progress. Progress. We should be growing more in the likeness of Christ. Progress. May we have progress. So just sharing a few principles about how to die to sin. The first one is this. Lose your small ambitions. And what I mean by this is when we give our lives to Christ, we settle for small ambitions like, God, just help me reach some of my goals and inspire me today so I can feel better about myself and my life. When we have been given resurrection power, that brought Jesus from the dead, now lives inside of us when we surrender our lives to Christ. We have the flow of the power of the Spirit, and yet we settle for small ambitions. We pray for small things. May we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, not settle for small ambitions, but pray big in the name of Christ, that lives would be changed, that marriages would be healed, that kids would no longer be oppressed or anxious or stressed or in addictions. We must throw away our small ambitions and be filled with the Holy Spirit and pray for big things to happen because we have the resurrection power living in us. Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united with Him in death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. C.S. Lewis talks about this life that we live and comparing it to a renovation project. And let me just read from what his, what his explanation is about our lives. We think that means God is going to repair just a leaky faucet, 
maybe some new paint. But we get alarmed when he starts tearing down stuff, knocking down walls, adding new wings, building an extra floor, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, Lewis says. But he is building a palace which he intends to live in himself. If we will let him, he will make the feeblest of us into dazzling, radiant, immortal creatures, pulsating with such energy, joy, wisdom, and love that we cannot now imagine. The process will be long and in parts painful, but that is what we're in for and nothing less. That's the first step of dying to self, this mortification of our sin, as the Apostle Paul calls it. We must kill our sin. Secondly, learn to hate your sin. Now, we're good at hating other people's sin. Have you noticed that? We're real good at hating other people's sin. I'm talking about hating your own sin. May we hate our sin. We must hate what sin does to us. Sin is insidious. It creeps in, and we tend to just kind of let it move in and live with us. And we rationalize it, and we think it's no big deal, and we think we've got it under control. May we hate our sin. Paul said this in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Some are like, well, God loves to forgive, and I love to sin. I like this arrangement. I'll just keep sinning you know, to help God do what he loves to do, which is forgive. And what does Paul say? Au contraire, mon frere! Exclamation point, emoji, emoji. I mean, come on. This, like, some of us live like that. Like, oh, it's all, you know, he'll forgive me. He loves to forgive. He's love. Well, yes, justification. But we're talking sanctification. Sanctification. May we learn to hate our sin. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, Paul says, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Of course, we don't like the word slave, but the reality is we are slaves to whoever we're obeying, and if we're obeying ourself and our flesh, we are slaves to that. Or are we slaves to righteousness, which is being right with God and right with others, the cruciform life. Be right with God and right with others. That's what righteous means. So may we learn to hate our sin. Third, remember who you are. Remember who you are. You are a child of God. Sanctification is becoming the people God designed us to be. I forget who said this about, you know, a pen is being sanctified when it's being written with because it's designed to write. A car is being sanctified when it's being driven because it's designed to drive. Kale is being sanctified when it goes down the disposal. That's where, that's the design. Did I offend any, anybody? I don't know. I apologize for that. These are terrible. I remember this illustration long ago. My youth director, Ray Briggs, shared this with me. You, you've, heard, you've heard it said that elephants have great memories. Have you, have you heard that before? And it's fascinating. They will take a baby elephant with a rope and a stake in the ground at the circus, and they train it. And this, you know, for a baby elephant, even though it's big, they've got the appropriate stake and rope holding it still in a, in a place so that it goes in a circle. And it would pull and try to yank, but it can't ever get out. So it's pulling, it's stuck, it locks in. Like, the more I pull, the, the more nothing happens, and I just walk in a circle. That's how they train them to walk in a And then they become mammoth, where, are you kidding me? How are they held by this little rope and a stake? Like, a sneeze would set them free. But the problem is, Their memory, they remember that they were stuck and said they don't even try to get unstuck. I've been there. I know you've been there. You've been stuck in remembering that you were someone God never intended you to be. God never intended us to be stuck and in a rut, just going in circles. We've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of the resurrection of Christ living in and through us so that all may experience the joy of salvation. Romans 6, 11, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So, how do we engage with sanctification? Again, lose your small ambitions we talked about. Learn to hate your sin. Remember who you are. And fourthly, cooperate with the Holy Spirit. 
Sanctification isn't trying harder. That's legalism, and that won't work. But usually the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Am I right? The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And God gives us a new heart, Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to be careful to keep my laws. You see, what God commands you to do, he enables us to do. He doesn't just say, good luck with this. What he commands us to do through the Holy Spirit, he enables us to do, to carry out his will. We have to understand, in order to win, we actually have to lose. We must lose to ourself, to our selfish desires, and surrender to the will of God. And that's shaping character in us, and it's not fun sometimes. There's a great illustration of chiseling. God is chiseling off the rough edges of our lives, and it hurts. It's not fun, but he's shaping us more and more into the likeness of Christ. So, four specific action steps to close, and then we'll receive communion together. And I hope you all have your portable elements that we'll receive together at the end of the service. Four specific action steps to experience and practice sanctification. They all start with R, not because my name does, but anyway, repent. Repent, we've talked about this word. It just means turn away from your sin. Turn away from your destructive path. Turn away from the road that is leading to death. Don't go off the cliff. Turn away and come back toward God. That is, like we said, the mortification of sin. Repent. Secondly, receive Jesus' forgiveness. Just receive it. Remember, salvation is not achieved, it's received. And so receive his forgiveness. You're not meant to be stuck in shame. Move past being stuck in shame. We were made for grace. We were made for freedom. And then rebuke the lie. Satan wants to tell you your greed is a good thing because you're working hard to provide for your family. But the reality is your greed is making you work more to get more, to satisfy yourself, and someday when then thinking, when I get this, then I'll have this, will never be satisfied. Or your lust, which objectifies humans made in the image of God, never gets satisfied. We must rebuke the lie that is inside of us when we start chasing sin, when we start chasing after the created things, sex, money, and power, which are good, but they're not ultimate. Our creator created those for us to enjoy under his rule and way. His kingdom. Repent, receive Jesus' forgiveness, rebuke the lie, and replace the sin with things that bring life. So you heard about mortification, kill your sin, and then vivification. Things that replace that sin with life. Going for a walk in nature, acknowledging God's created order, reading God's scripture in the morning, we know that the day doesn't begin without coffee. Am I right? I don't know. Maybe some of you have never had. So I just heard the other day that Garth Brooks has never had coffee. That's hard for me to believe. I'm just saying. I don't know. But he, he's a happy man, and so he makes his wife a cup of coffee every day. Anyway, that was random. I probably should have pushed edit on that one, maybe. But the point is this. Find things to replace your sin, the vivification, things that add life. That's a calling to the sanctified life. You've heard about this old story. I think it was a Native American that said, I have two wolves inside of me, a good wolf and a bad wolf. And when asked, well, which one wins? He said, whichever one I feed. That's the Holy Spirit that we feed in us or the flesh that coincides in us. Are we going to feed the flesh or are we going to feed the spirit? That's what sanctification is, feeding the spirit. Adding life, life in Christ. That's when we live the full life. That's through prayer, through worship. By the way, nobody gets sanctified alone. We get sanctified in community. We get sanctified in shared life together, praying for each other, keeping each other accountable, and that word has been hijacked, but sharpening each other, encouraging each other. In fact, I'm reminded of a story of a young man who was just leading a selfish life. 
single in his 20s. He was dating a girl, but lived in a house with some roommates. And, you know, he took the best room. He never cleaned up. He drank way too much. Eventually, his girlfriend dumped him. He's like, I had enough. Maybe that was why he was drinking too much, just to numb the pain that all of his relationships were broken. Until one of his buddies said, come to Bible study. And he used Proverbs. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. But he's like, is there like iron work? What's happening? I don't know. Are we, are we making knives? What, what is this iron? Come to Bible study. And eventually he came. And he saw a group of men who were praying for each other, caring for each other, serving together. Instead of going on crazy trips, they went on crazy trips for Jesus. They'd go to Africa and install water wells so that an entire community centered around a Christ-centered community of church could have clean water instead of dumping money into epic man party trips, whatever. You know them, right? That's what the church is about. And this guy finally said enough, and he surrendered. And over time, his old girlfriend who dumped him came back. They got married. Is life perfect for them? No. But are they aiming to be like Christ? Yes, every day. That's the path of sanctification. That's what we've been called to do. May we repent. May we receive the grace of Jesus. May we rebuke the lie. May we replace the sin with life-giving thanks. And may we remember who we are. We are children of God, made in the image of our good, good Father, who has created us, Ephesians 2 says, predestined us to do good works. Not to be saved, but to glorify God. So with that, I'm going to invite Nick and the worship team up and grab your elements as we partake and receive this free gift. These are symbols, right? Sacraments of the life-giving sacrifice of Jesus so that we can live life for Jesus, with Jesus, bringing others on this journey. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. Break your little wafer that's at the top here. And as he took this bread, he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and as he poured it out, he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink from this cup, remember me. And he declared that when we, the body of Christ, the church, receive these sacraments, we are proclaiming the hope that Christ will return. And he will bring us back into our glorification. But we're in the middle of, after being justified, living out a sanctified life, awaiting the glorified life. Allow me to pray, and then we'll sing, Nick's going to lead us in Waymaker. It is God who makes a way. Heavenly Father, help us to remember we are your children and you love us. And you have so much more for us to be set free. And we acknowledge that there are moments where we don't see you and it doesn't feel like you're at work, but we acknowledge you are always at work. You are revealing yourself to us always. And so right now, Holy Spirit, open up our eyes to see you and our hearts to feel you that you are at work shaping us more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. It's in the powerful name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and worship God. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here.
If you've been moved by the Holy Spirit and you feel compelled to be baptized two weeks from today, you're invited to go public with your faith. We have several people already signed up. You can just reach out to me, text me, email me, call the office, whatever. We are meeting an hour before the worship service next week to just learn more about baptism. If you even want to come out of curiosity, you can come to that an hour before the service. And then the next week, that's the 19th, it's Father's Day. Good, good father. Bring your family. We are worshiping together inside and then going outside for baptism. And then having barbecue and bounce houses and all the things. But if you feel compelled, moved by the Spirit, to go public with your faith, let me know. That's in two weeks, baptism. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.